It's Platt, and today we head to Latrobe, Pennsylvania. That's next to Platt's Beer of the Week. So the particular beer we have with us today is Rolling Rock. Uh, Rolling Rock was suggested to us by one of our viewers. Turtle look like Urkel. Turtle, this beer's for you, buddy. A uh, little history on Rolling Rock uh, dates back to 1933 when the Tito brothers purchased the Latrobe Brewery. Uh, now at the time we were just getting ready to come out of Prohibition and the Tito brothers decided, well, there's probably a lot of pent up demand for beer, so we better get in the beer business. And boy, did they hit a home run with that, that's for sure. Uh, it wasn't until about six years later, though, in 1939, that uh, Latrobe Brewery came out with their uh, flagship beer, Rolling Rock, um, and the rest, they say, is history. It became one of the great regional, local brands in the U.S. Um, they continued to uh, produce the beer in Latrobe uh, up until 2006. A little bit about Latrobe. Latrobe is about 34 miles outside of Pittsburgh and the home of Arnold Palmer, the golfing great for uh, those golfers out there. Now, like I said, they kept pr producing beer there in Latrobe till 2006. Well, what happened in 2006? Unfortunately, the evil empire showed up. And when I say evil empire, I'm referring to Anheuser-Busch. Now, a lot of these videos, I've always kind of stuck up for Anheuser-Busch. If, if anything, I've stuck out up for the brewer that sold out to them. You know, they got, you know, they put a lot of time and effort into the brewery. They have the right to cash out. Uh, unfortunately, this is one of the situations where Anheuser-Busch acted like the evil, evil empire. Because when they bought the band, brand from actually InBev, at the time this was pre-merger when the two companies were separate, I guess InBev had already purchased the, the brand, when Heiser Bush took over, one of the first things he did was take a great local regional Pennsylvania brew and move production to New Jersey, Newark, New Jersey. Really? Um, nothing gets the fine folks in Newark, New Jersey, but a Pennsylvania beer being made in New York, just Newark, uh, just doesn't uh, sound right. This ended up causing a lot of hurt feelings. Uh, some of the unions there in Pennsylvania decided to uh, boycott. Anheuser-Busch and InBev products. Um, I don't know how long that lasted, but again, it just caused a lot of hurt feelings for what? Maybe to save half a, half a cent a bottle or something like that. What you know, Whatever the, these moves are obviously made for economics. I, I don't know how they won on this deal. And unfortunately, this wasn't the last kind of boneheaded move uh, AB, NB, AB did with uh, Rolling Rock. Um, one of the first things they did and one of the cool things about Rolling Rock is the little pledge on the back of the beer that they've had for years and years and years, and it states, from the, from the glass line tanks of old Latrobe, we tender this premium beer for, for your enjoyment as a tribute to your good taste. It comes from the mountain springs to you. Now, unfortunately, they're not in Latrobe anymore. So Anheuser-Busch had to come back with a little addendum above this. Uh, to honor the tradition of this great brand, we quote from the original Pledge of Quality. So they broke the Pledge of Quality, but we'll add a little addendum to it. Um, again, probably not <laughs> the best move Ben Anheuser-Busch, but it is what it is. And like I said, though, they didn't stop there because... Another thing, and we read in the pledge, they talked about glass line tanks. I, I believe they're fermentation tanks. At the time when they imp implemented that technology, it was kind of new, it was kind of hip, uh, it was supposedly better for sanitation. Just another thing that made Rolling Rock unique. So, of course, why did Anheuser-Busch do? By the time 2015 rolled around, they quit using the gas line tanks for Rolling Rock that went into a bottle. For some reason, they still utilize the glass line tanks for Rolling Rock that goes into the can. I don't know if this is kind of a reverse Keystone thing. You remember Keystone beer, bottle beer taste in a can? I don't. Again, this is this is one of those things. You aren't losing money on this beer, AB. There's no need to to do these cuts. Again, this is a great traditional brand and set tradition that keeps people buying this stuff. I I don't know. They decide to to mess with it. Again, I can't defend them this time. Uh, another thing uh, unique about Rolling Rock that I thought was really cool was 
their use of the pony bottle. For those you may not know, a pony bottle is a seven ounce beer bottle compared to the standard 12 ounce beer bottle. Uh, I always have kind of loved those. I had a friend in college that drove for Coors. I remember him bringing me over a couple cases of the pony bottles and man, those go down easy. And because there's, you know, they're only seven ounces, you drink them faster, the beer stays cold. It's just kind of cool. You know, I just always liked it. And uh, Rolling Rock had such a success with that that a lot of people uh, assume that the term pony bottle is in reference to the horse that's on the uh, front of the beer bottle. Really cool sounding story. Unfortunately, though, that's not true. Pony bottles had been around and they've been, they've been called pony bottles and been used for about 50 years before Rolling Rock uh, came out with theirs. So cool story, but it just went true. But because of their success, it ended up pushing some regional and national brands to using uh, pony bottles in the early 70s. Uh, probably the most famous of those is Miller High Life. And I believe to this day, you can still find those pony bottles, which I think is really cool. Well, before we try this beer though, let's check out the stats. All right, so today I thought we'd talk about another thing that makes Rolling Rock unique. And I think it just symbolizes these, these really cool, old, regional, local brands, these kind of forgotten brands, is, is they were around pre-internet stuff, and you could have kind of stories and legends and stuff. Um, you might remember me talking about with Lone Star Beer, the Lone Star Armadillo. Well, for Rolling Rock, it's the number 33. You know, we read on the bottom of the pledge, there's the number 33. And there's been a lot of urban myths, legends. Where did the number 33 come from? Uh, one of the famous stories is that 33 stands for 1933, the year the Pittsburgh Steelers came into existence. Uh, which is kind of cool because that's a local team. And also, they do have training camp at La Trobe every year. So, that kind of makes a little sense. Another uh, legend out there is that 33 stands for 33 degrees, proper serving temperature for Rolling Rock. Uh, hopefully, I, I presume most of my uh, viewers out there kind of see through that, that 33 is too, too cold, too close to freezing, that e even these light loggers, yes, they're better cold, but 40 to 45 is generally a better serving temperature. But again, that sounds like a cool story. Uh, another one out there is that the 33, again, is from 1933, but that's the year Prohibition was repealed and also the year the Tito brothers bought Latrobe Brewing. Again, both really cool stories. Probably the closest thing to the truth uh, kind of came in an interview. Gentleman named James Tito, former CEO of Latrobe Brewing, kind of opined one time, didn't come out directly say, but kind of, like I said, opined that the 33 came from the 33 words that were in the pledge. So that's I'm going to say that's probably where that came from, but I like those other stories too. Again, that's what the, makes these great old regional brands just so cool because you couldn't have something like that nowadays without seeming kind of silly or, you know, you know it's kind of just a goofy marketing gimmick where, again, just these beers were brewed at a simpler time and, again, urban myths, you know, uh, predated memes. Well, with that being said, let's try some Rolling Rock. All right. Well, nice straw, maybe light gold. We get almost a finger of white foam. Um... You know what? I kind of pick up a little Euro green beer, you know, kind of a Euro lager, the green beer funkiness that you get in a lot of those beers. Let's give it a try. That's nice. Uh, nice, clean, light body beer. Um, does, you know, a lot of people I've... I've Heard this beer referred to before more just because the bottle, like poor man's Heineken or whatever. Not as skunky as Heineken could get, you know, not as funky. Um, a little lighter bodied. Uh, like I said, you don't get that skunkiness uh, that you would from a Heineken. Lighter bodied beer. Um, I'm going to say, though, more, more full bodied than, of course, like Bud Light Miller Light. Uh, more on the kind of Budweiser 
full body light or full body pale lager, um, or fuller body because that none of these pale lagers you know are really full body, but fuller body, uh, you know, American lager. Not much hops, a little sweetness toward the front. I think there's a little corn in the mix on this beer. So yeah, it's, it's an adjunct. You're gonna get a little bit of that sweetness. Overall, nice beer. Not uh, The thing about a lot of these beers, you know, again, it was a similar style, a pale American lager. They just try to make it nice, clean, easy drinking. They, they weren't trying to reinvent the wheel. And again, it was your regional brewery. You probably knew a guy that worked there. You know, you, you drank a ton of it at the Steeler games. It just, it, there was more to it than just the beer, even though we love beer here at the Platte Art Channel. Don't get me wrong, it's very important. But there was kind of a community around it, a, a vibe around these uh, regional breweries that's it's just kind of lost today. Um... You know, maybe I'm just be maybe I'm just an old guy or whatever. But anyway, uh, like I said, nice easy drinker, great regional brand, great stories, great history behind it. Just overall, cool beer. Well, I hope you liked this video. If you did, please subscribe down below. Also, please like the video because it lets YouTube know we're putting out good content. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, you can always leave them in the comment section or contact me on the Twitter page. Till next time, bottoms up.